Yep, all good. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the future of UV EV advanced manufacturing trends, strategies, and applications. A regular webinar series presented by the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in collaboration with RadTech International North America, the Association for UV and EV Technology. My name is Brandon Murphy, and I'll be your host today from SUNY ESF. As a reminder, all the webinars in the RadTech series are recorded and they're posted and archived at the address shown there. You'll also get an email after this uh, reminding you what that web address is. And the, um, the recordings are usually up within a, a day or two. Uh, there's a keep an eye out for in January 2020, there'll be a new, another webinar in the series on cationic cure. And just one other reminder is that the RadTech 2020 UVE the Technology Conference is coming right up, uh, March 9th through 11th at Disney in Orlando. Uh, I think there may be a few exhibitor spots left available. Um, uh, you can register, find out more information at radtech2020.com or the RadTech website. That's radtech.org for more info and to register. So I am going to turn things over for this webinar to Mike Bonner, who's going to be our MC today. So Mike, you can take it away. Thanks, Brandon. Hi, as you just mentioned, my name's Mike Bonner, and I'm the Vice President of Engineering and Technology for St. Clair Systems. Uh, we, we provide viscosity and temperature control systems for industrial fluid dispensing processes of all kinds, uh, paint, sealers, adhesives, coatings, potting encapsulants, you name it. Because of this background, I have the privilege of serving as the chair of RadTech's application support group. And this was formed almost two years ago out of the realization that as an organization, we were very strong at helping our industry with formulation and curing technologies, but less focused on the technologies in between, but those involved in getting that carefully crafted formulation onto the part and into the curing process. So today, I'm pleased to be here with three very knowledgeable and very talented individuals to talk about three very different topics, but each of critical interest to our end users. So without further ado, to start us off is Mike Kelly. He's the Vice President of Global Sales for Allied Photochemical. Mike's gonna help us dispel the myth that UV cure coatings are not cost effective. He's gonna use a case study from the pipe coating industry to contrast the cost of using solvent-borne, water-borne, and UV curable coating all for the same application. Mike? Hi. Uh, good afternoon to everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, again, I'm Mike Kelly from Allied Photochemical. We're up based in Michigan, um, where it's very cold right now. I think it's cold everywhere. Um, I'd like to talk to you about what's going on in the industry at, at this time, and, and I think into the foreseeable future, is that um, people, companies, and customers are becoming more, more competitive, more demanding, um, as they receive your pr products that are made. made. Um, they also are trying to eliminate variability in the process. Um, so we, we believe that um, consistency and persistency is my volume on. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, fa fantastic. Um, and it's critical that you use proven technology um, with your process. So in, in essence, UV coatings everywhere. If you go to the dentist today, you can get a filling, the UV, that's a UV light, a form of UV. I had a root canal recently. The drill bits are color-coded with UV. Um, but UV coatings are everywhere. Um, a lot of times you don't hear about customers using them because it's proprietary to their process. But a lot of pipe and tube applications on metal, um, you see color UV clear coats, you see stenciling, you see all types of... Um, gel coats like on the oxygen tanks, cosmetic jars, uh, appliance industry where it's, uh, it's formed after it's UV printed. Those are all readily available uh, UV applications um, that are available in the market today and being used to, to drive efficiency with customers. If you look at some of the costs that are incurred from a customer when you have an issue with your process, it's actually resolving the problem, having that problem engagement with the customers lost time. Um, it's unproductive time. Time to resolve those issues um, are extensive, and it can be an impact to your business. Chargebacks, if there's any return of product, 
uh, relationship impact. A lot of times I hear people saying, hey, my, co my costs of quality are a certain amount, but it really isn't that amount. It's much more because of the opportunity cost, the, the damage to your relationship and the lost future orders with that customer. So UVs have, UV coatings have significant advantages um, in, the, in the market. Because of the improved corrosion protection, Uh, then uh, the near-zero VOCs, uh, volatile organic compounds that have air pollutants. The coating cost per linear foot is typically very competitive, if not uh, better, non-flammable, um, and then coatings will not freeze. So in Michigan, you know, five months out of the year, the, the temperature will impact uh, your shipping of water-based products where UV is not affected um, during that period of the, the year. So let's look at the percent solids game. And you have to look at yourself. These are just some pricing that's available that we picked up on the market. They're examples. Um, your application will vary. But if you have a solvent-based coating that's at 18% solid, price of 11.71 a gallon. Water-based, same thing, 27% solid with a little bit higher price. And UV, 100% solid. It's a liquid, but it's, that means there's no carriers, no fillers, or anything like that. And that's at 51.24. And you know, which is the cheaper? Which one's less? A lot of people will say it's the solvent base. But if you really look at it and you look at the applied cost, it's, it's not. It's, it's, and we'll go through that and um, show you the difference. Um, we've also placed on our website ROI calculators. So you can go to our website and you can actually calculate um, your own application um, based on a, a tube or a flat meteor or a discrete part. So let's look at uh, the next slide, which goes about wet film, dry film, um, and what the comparison is. Of an 18% solid, you're putting on the coating at a significant thickness, and then it's evaporating. So the solvent's evaporating. That's where a lot of cases we have the VOCs, and you'll end up with one, one mil dry film. Water-based, same type of approach. You're putting on anywhere between three and four mils to get close to your one mil dry. But with UV 100% solids, it goes on as a liquid, but nothing evaporates, not, nothing outgasses, uh, and it ends up one mil wet is one mil dry. So if you run the math and you're looking at, you know, 18% um, solids, 27% solids, 100% solids, it's sort of like a can of Coke. Um, you're only really getting, with the solvent, 18% of your drink. The rest is, is solvent. Um, and when you're calculating square footage, you're taking the 18%, which is the 0.18, times the amount of square feet of uh, coating at one mil, and you're going to end up at about 289 square feet at one mil thick. Same with the water base. It's a 27% factor. So you end up with you know, 433, a little bit over that in square footage. Um, in UV, it's 100% solid as a liquid. Um, there is nothing that goes, leaves that coating. So you end up with the full coverage of 1,604 square feet of coverage. So if you run the math and you're looking at it, I'm going to be coating some large oil pipes. So it's 45-foot section, 9.625 in diameter, 1 mil dry thick. So for that one gallon of solvent, you're going to run only 2.55 pieces of pipe for that whole gallon because, in essence, that's 82% solvent that's just evaporating. In the case of the water base, you're going to end up with 3.83 pieces of pipe, um, which is 172 linear feet. And then with the UV, you're going to be extreme high utilization, which gives you 14.17 pieces, which is about 637 linear feet. So when you run that and you're looking at where's the best optimization per, per gallon, it's it's UV. And in the case of transport or handling and all that, you're handling internally to your plant significantly less coating. So if you look at sort of the breakdown and how do you get and equate how much solvent coating you would need to, to equal one gallon of UV, you basically, it's simple math. You've got, you need to add 2.55 pieces to 2.55 pieces, and then you continually add you get to the total of 14.17 pieces. 
And you can see there, it actually adds up to be a little over 5.5 gallons of solvent-based coating that you would need to equal one gallon of 100% solid UV. So at the end of the day, you're looking at 5.56 gallons at the price, which totals $65.07. So that means you're taking 5.56 gallons times 11.71 per gallon to get that price. If you look at water-based, it's a similar story. In this case, you've got you need 3.7 gallons of the water base, which is at 27% solid. And so you would take the 3.7 gallons times the price of $15.13, and you get $55.98. So again, three point, right around 3.7 gallons of material to equate to one gallon of UV. In the case of UV, it's pretty self-explanatory. You just need one gallon, and that gives you the 14.17 pieces at a cost of $51.24. So if you look at the summary sheet and you sort of go across, you've got UV in the green, 100% solid. You go down, it's a total of $51.24. So you need one gallon. In the case of the solvent, as I described earlier, it's the 18% solid. You need 5.56 gallons for a price of $65.07. In the case of the water base, 27% solid at a price of $15.17, you need 3.7 gallons for a price of $55.98. So at the end of the day, the applied cost for the UV material is, is the least amount. But there's a ton of other factors that go into um, cost savings with using the UV 100% solid technology. As I mentioned to you earlier, there's an ROI calculator on our website. You can go in there and click on any of the buttons, and you can download an Excel spreadsheet. It's not protected, so you can take a look and, and run anything that you want and modify it in any way you want. And again, we'd be happy to help you in, um, with that. The costing information, as I said to you, this is that ROI calculator that you can download. You just enter in the data, and it automatically fills out um, the boxes for you. And as you can see with the chart that I'm displaying now, when you enter the size pipe that we were just talking about, which is 9.625 in diameter at one mil thick, with the pricing, you can see that UV comes out to be about 8.05 cents per linear foot uh, at one mil thick. So this is something you could do for your application, um, and you can modify this any way you want. But you can see that the UV per linear foot um, is less priced than the solvent um, and the uh, water base. There's a lot of other factors that play into that. So in this case, we're using a cost example of 45 foot pieces times 300,000 pieces made in a year. And you can see the calculation um, for total cost of coating. Um, the solvent's at 1.37 million water at 1.188 million, and UV is at 1.0686 million. You can see the UV has some significant savings from a actual just coating cost. And then with other items, there's less freight, less cleanup, quality costs. So there's no, it's cured instantly, so there's no downstream wet coatings on rollers or any issues that go with handling. Um, there's no VOC, which is a significant uh, factor in a lot of places. A lot of water-based uh, coatings have co-solvents, so sometimes they're flammable. Solvent coatings by themselves are flammable. And then UV is a very small physical footprint. Um, and there's many other factors that go along with um, UV coatings, the benefits. Typically, you can run much faster. Um, and again, as I mentioned to you, it's significantly cleaner. So at, at the end of the day, UV coatings have a higher cost per gallon, and that, that's the, the shock. Boy, it's that much per gallon. But at the end of the day, you're getting a full gallon of coating. As I mentioned, non-flammable. There's no restrictions on shipments during winter. Um, it can be stored in non-heated areas. And shipping costs are greatly reduced because you're shipping a lot less water and solvent. You're shipping all coating. And the overall applied coating cost for linear foot in this case is, is less. And, and, and I've seen cases where it's significantly more than what I've demonstrated um, in this presentation. 
So at the end of the day, UV is smaller. Again, the footprint for the equipment is significantly smaller. You can run much faster typically. Um, and it's fully dry. It's not dry and then cured downstream. It is fully dry and cross-linked when it exits the UV light. Um, so you can handle it. There's no safety issues with slippage, lubrication, or downstream coating um, getting unemployed. And as I mentioned to you, it's cleaner, near solvent, near zero um, VOCs, half, no co-solvents, and no emission abatement, no, no RTOs for burning um, the VOCs. And again, I appreciate your time and uh, have the opportunity to present to you the, uh, the cost advantages of UV coatings over solvent and water. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I know that's a, a hot topic everywhere, so we appreciate that. Uh, next, Wilson Lee, the Business Development Director for Intercon Industries, is going to talk about surface pretreatment for UV coatings and adhesives. Uh, he's going to cover various options for prepping the surface prior to applying a material to assure that you get a good bond. So with that, Wilson? All right, thank you. Again, as he just said, we're going to discuss the surface. Uh, we do a lot with UV coatings, printings, adhesives, and one of the forgotten factors generally is the surface that you are uh, bonding or printing or coating onto uh, and making sure that that is a good uh, surface with which to do that. So we're going to talk a little bit about prepping that surface uh, before you apply the coating or the print. Uh, why use plasma? Uh, one of the re these are the reasons that we typically look at. Uh, we can create stronger bonds. That's because we're increasing the surface energy of the material that we're uh, bonding to. Uh, we can reduce material costs. Many times you can use less, especially in the cases of adhesives and inks, you can use less material uh, to create the exact same bond or print that you're looking for. You can increase throughput because of that. Uh, the product quality is going to increase because you are uh, printing or coating or bonding onto the same surface every time. Other methods of prepping a surface are generally highly variable uh, depending on the operator and using plasma and flame or other uh, techniques that we use, you can do that very repeatedly. So. That's what we look for when we try to prep a surface, and these are the advantages. Uh, so what, do we, what does plasma do to the surface? Uh, we had a little bit of issue with this slide. apologize for that. Plasma is the fourth state of matter. Uh, generally, these things are bouncing around the screen here, so I apologize that that didn't happen in this medium. Uh, but what is in plasma? Plasma is, again, charged atoms. Uh, you get free electrons, you get free radicals, you get positive and negative ions. You do get ultraviolet light uh, and then the random electrodes bouncing around. Uh, the most common form of plasma that you see every day, of course, is uh, lightning. And generally, it's actually the air around the lightning strike that is turned to plasma. Uh, other examples are the northern lights and the southern lights. Uh, and any time you have an electrical discharge, as a matter of fact, we use an electrical discharge to create the plasma. So what does plasma do to the surface? It does three things. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the cleaning effect. Uh, what you're seeing here is the plasma being discharged onto the surface on the left-hand side. You can see the contaminated surface, and on the right, you can see the clean surface. Uh, there's two types of contaminants, organic and inorganic. As far as organics, those are usually hydrocarbon chains, uh, hydrocarbon chains, I should say. Uh, what happens when you bombard those with hydrogen and oxygen ions is you turn those into uh, CO2 and water vapor, and those just disappear into the air. Uh, when you're looking at inorganic compounds, uh, then we have to look at more of what you're trying to get off and then the thickness and then the cycle time. There's a lot of inorganics that plasma can remove and flame can remove. There are other ones that you cannot remove, so you just have to uh, reach out for me and we can discuss what we, what we can and can't do with plasma. Uh, but in most cases, it just affects your cycle time and how fast you can treat the, the material. But the first thing that plasma does is it cleans the surface. Second, we etch the surface. Now, this is a micro etch. You see we're on the scale of about three, uh, 5 to 30 nanometers. On the left-hand side, you can see a manufactured film surface uh, that is very smooth. And after it goes through the plasma, you can see that we have roughened that surface. That would be similar to ablating the surface in some way or sanding the surface in some way. What you're doing here is just increasing the usable surface area with which you're bonding to. So the more surface area I have, the better the bond that I'm going to get with my coating 
or my print or my adhesive. So the second thing the plasma does is etch the surface. Now most importantly, plasma functionalizes the surface. And by that I mean we are changing the outermost molecular layers of that surface and putting polar groups uh, and covalent bonds onto that surface that make it easier to bond to. Uh, every material has a surface energy. Plastics generally have a lower surface energy than metals, and so you need a higher surface energy in most cases to get a better bond. So what we do when, when you treat that surface, we are adding O2 groups, OH groups, uh, and of course, in the, excuse me, in the uh, example with flame, we're going to add carboxyl groups to that surface. All of those are polar groups that are going to increase that surface energy and allow you to get a better bond. So the three things that plasma does, again, it cleans, it etches, and it functionalizes the surface. So a little bit about adhesive basics. Um, there are two forces at work uh, on the surface. One is cohesion. That is the forces between the molecules of your liquid or your adhesive or your coating. And then you have the forces of adhesion, which is the, the, the uh, the forces between your liquid, your coating, and the surface itself. When you rain -ex your windshield or when you wax your car, you are decreasing the forces of adhesion. So the water molecules are going to beat up and roll off. Uh, what we do with plasma is just the opposite. We are increasing the forces of adhesion, and that way we are overcoming the forces of cohesion between the molecules inside the material, the liquid again, or the adhesive. And so that allows the surface to wet out, as you see there on the left-hand side of our sample piece, uh, and that is a treated surface. The untreated surface is, of course, the one on the right, and that's what's beating up. You can also generally see from that picture that the coating is much thinner than it is uh, on the right. So if I'm using, uh, if I had to cover that entire surface on the right-hand side that's untreated with an adhesive, for instance, or a, an ink, uh, that ink or adhesive would be much thicker on that uh, side than the left-hand side. So that's where you're showing your, uh, your ability to reduce some of your uh, materials that you're using. Next, impediments to adhesion. Uh, this is our surface here uh, that causes us not to have good adhesion and some of the things uh, that uh, affect the adhesion. First is low energy. Again, plastic surfaces have a low surface energy in general, so to in we need to increase those by adding polar groups to that. Uh, also, we have surface contamination. That might be, as I said before, an inorganic or an organic contamination that needs to be removed. Uh, the material might have additives in there, such as flame retardants. Those things can come to the surface and decrease the surface energy. They can also affect your ability to bond. All of those things give you limited bonding sites, and that makes a surface that is very hydrophobic. Uh, and what we're looking for in any kind of bonding, whether it's coating, printing, or uh, adhesives, is a very hydrophilic surface, and that will give you a better bond. So. Selecting the right plasma technology for your application. We have basically four different coatings. I'm having a hard time getting it to change. There we go. Uh, apologize for that. We use Corona, Plasma, and Flame at Intercon depending on the application. Corona is not discussed in this application. That's more of a web type application, roll to roll printing on films. Uh, but the first one we're going to talk about today in what we call our object treating series is the blown arc. Now, the blown arc treats it about three and a half inches wide. Uh, it is only a, can be used on non-conductive. Uh, what you're basically doing is blowing compressed air over a very high amperage arc, and it is blowing onto that surface and adding those polar groups that we discussed before. Uh, it is a relatively slow application. You only go about five to ten uh, feet per minute, but you can do, again, about three and a half inches of width. So there are certain applications, a lot of printing applications or labeling applications or UV applications that uh, you need to do a wide area coating, and this would be perfect for that as long as you're not having to go at a very high speed. Next is our blown ion plasma. This is what most people think of when they, when they see plasma. Uh, you're treating about 3 eighths of an inch to 5 eighths of an inch. Uh, it works on both conductive and non-conductive surfaces, so it doesn't, it'll work on just about anything. Uh, it's very good for uh, a spot treatment or a glue line or an adhesive line or a printing line. Uh, it can also reach down into crevices. Has a very minimal dwell time. You can go very fast with this unit. We can go between 50 feet per minute and sometimes 150 or 200 feet per minute. Uh, it's also easy, easy to add heads to this uh, in case you need wider areas or 
uh, you want to go even faster, say five or 600 feet per minute. So this is what we consider our air plasma. Uh, this is also in our air plasma series. This is a new product for us. It's called the Blown Ion 500 Multiport. Uh, you see below there that it's actually got six heads inside of that treating your surface. So now instead of only being able to treat about a half an inch with the Blown Ion 125 that we showed you a second ago, this is going to treat two inches at a very consistent uniform treatment level. Uh, there are other ways to go out to two inches wide using plasma. Most of those include some sort of rotary system where you're taking one jet and spinning it around and trying to cover a large area. There are some really good applications for that in thin films, but if I need to really get a good treatment on that surface and increase the surface energy, I'm going to get a more uniform coating and a much more uh, intense coating. And we use ion density as a way to measure that onto that surface by using uh, again, the Blown Ion 500. Uh, coming here in a couple of months, we should have the Blown Ion 750 as well. That's going to go out to three inches wide, which will make the treatment of uh, treatment cost per linear inch to continue to go down, which is one of our goals. And then we have our flame treatment systems. Flame works very well. Uh, it, it does a little bit different effect on the surface. Again, I mentioned before that it puts carboxyl groups onto the surface rather than the hydroxyl groups that plasma puts on there. Uh, it does have advantages, though. Uh, economically, you can go much wider uh, for a lower cost with flame. Also, with flame, I don't need to I don't need to be as precise a distance away from the material as I do with plasma. In general, with plasma, I'm looking at maybe a quarter to three quarters of an inch away from the part, uh, whereas flame, I can throw that six or eight inches and still get a good uniform treatment of the part. So uh, flame is used in a lot of applications where you're talking about bigger parts, uh, bigger coatings, uh, bigger areas, I should say, that you're going to coat, and it's not necessarily flat. So I can go across that area in uh, a very, very quick amount of time and the surface is prepped for whatever your next UV step is. I don't believe I have a conclusion slide on here, but I'll just say that, uh, again, plasma, flame basically do three things. Uh, they clean the surface, they etch the surface, and they functionalize the surface. All of these things are designed to increase your surface energy and improve your bond. And uh, if you have an application, uh, please give us a call and we will go through which of these technologies is best for your application. Okay, thanks, Wilson. I think often we forget how important it is to have a, a well-treated surface. So, okay, the next presentation is coming up. Last but certainly not least, we've got Brett Majorano of uh, the industrial gases business. He's the development manager for Atlas Copco. He's going to discuss nitrogen use and the UV coating process. And he's going to explain ways to optimize the nitrogen supply uh, when you need it in your process. So, Brett? Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so this uh, portion of the presentation, I guess, of the webinar is about uh, the places where you use nitrogen. Um, so I'll kind of just go through some of the basics of, uh, of nitrogen. So what is nitrogen? Nitrogen is a colorless, tasteless, odorless gas. 78% of the Earth's atmosphere is nitrogen. So it's abundant and very readily available, and it's got uh, essential uh, constituent of proteins and other biological products. And also, the most important relating to this is that it's an inert gas, which it does not react with other elements, which is why it's uh, used to blanket chemicals and to prevent fires. Um, the nitrogen uh, usage in the world is absolutely staggering. You'd be surprised how many applications require nitrogen food packaging, laser cutting, plastic extrusion, uh, wine, beer, cheese packing. The, I could go on and on and on. In this case, uh, it's UV curing. Um, so what we're doing is we're removing oxygen and replacing it with nitrogen because oxygen does bad things to many applications and certainly in UV. So we're just trying to limit the uh, O2 inhibition uh, that occurs. So nitrogen is the perfect replacement for nit uh, for oxygen. So, hmm. sorry, I went too far there. 
pre-radical polymerization. I have to admit, um, I hadn't uh, heard about that before, so I investigated and, uh, and learned about it and said, okay, I guess nitrogen is a good place for uh, to prevent free-radical polymerization as well. Since oxygen is the common inhibitor, the growing chain will react with the molecular oxygen, produce a radical, which is le uh, much less reactive, and this uh, significantly slows down the rate of propagation. I mean, it's a fancy way of saying you better get the oxygen out and put it with nitrogen so that you have a more effective process. So what's the problem? Well, since O2 is almost 21% of the air, it's going to be everywhere, O2 inhibition of free radical polymerization is a real and consistent issue that you can't get away from. What's the solution? The best way is to mitigate the O2 inhibition is to remove the oxygen from the cure zone by introducing an inert gas. And there is no better inert gas than nitrogen. So where do I get my nitrogen? So if I have a, a process that requires a steady flow of nitrogen or, or spike usage or, or whatever amount of nitrogen that's required, you're most likely going to get it from these companies. Everybody's probably recognized some of these companies. They're large $15 billion global companies. You see them on the road with the tankers filled with liquid nitrogen, and they're delivering nitrogen every day, all day across the world. Um, so that's where most people get their nitrogen. If you bought a UV equipment and you wanted nitrogen, you most likely are going to call purchasing or you're going to do your own investigation and you're going to call the gas company, one of these companies here, and they're going to deliver gas, uh, nitrogen. When I say gas, I mean nitrogen. They're going to deliver it to your facility. So when you call up to get a quote for your nitrogen, they're going to make a huge batch. So somewhere in all locations across the country and the globe, for that matter, large companies like Praxair are, are making nitrogen and oxygen in a large facility. So this uh, this little diagram here kind of just shows what the gas company does. Uh, they draw in ambient air, uh, compress it, pre-cool it with water, uh, remove the impurities by filtering it out, goes into a main heat exchanger that cools the air down significantly. So by a physical separation process at a low temperature, the pure nitrogen occurs at the top, oxygen falls to the bottom. Now we've separated the molecules, the gaseous nitrogen and oxygen, are put into a liquid form so they can be transported because you can't transport gas. You could, but you wouldn't be able to uh, transport enough of it. So you liquefy that gas, put it in a, a tank or a trucker, and deliver it to the application. Very simple. All they're doing is separating molecules, liquid, uh, putting it in a liquid form, bringing it to your facility, and then putting it through a vaporizer and then giving you the gas that you need for your UV equipment. So that's been the most common way for a long time to, to buy your nitrogen. But uh, over the last several years, there's been a lot of innovations in nitrogen generation, which Atlas Copco um, has done now for several years. Uh, we've perfected a, a compressed air, so we, we have a very uh, good background in that. And a nitrogen generator requires a compressor, so it goes well with our, with our business. So we got into uh, this basically because we saw how much people were paying for nitrogen, and we offer a better solution uh, at a much cheaper um, and more convenient way of getting your nitrogen. So when you call a gas company, they're going to figure out how much they want to charge your company for the nitrogen that you're buying. They're going to consider a few things. Uh, where are you located? How far do I have to drive? Are you on an island? Um, or do I have to take a, a, a freeway where there's a lot of traffic? Uh, do you live on a mountainside where there might be a mudslide? Um, there's just all kinds of things they have to take into consideration because the most the difficult part of uh, delivering nitrogen is actually delivering in the truck. So once they figure out where you are, say you're in a metropolitan city with a bunch of other companies around you, your price might be good. You're way out in the middle of nowhere, you might get a bad price. So there's several ways for them to deliver the gas to you. So if you order a small amount of nitrogen, you only need a few cubic feet per week, you might get one of these nitrogen cylinders. I think most people have seen these somewhere in a manufacturing plant or uh, all, on any number of facilities where these high pressure bottles are filled at high pressure with nitrogen. Uh, you can draw off that tank until it's empty, and then you uh, you turn it in and you get another tank. You pay a rental fee for that tank, and it's, uh, it goes on and on. And there's also some other uh, negatives to, to dealing with these high-pressure cylinders because they're explosive. People have to move them. Uh, they can hurt their back. Uh, safety directors are more than happy to get rid of an explosive bottle that's sitting around in their facility um, with, filled with high-pressure nitrogen. So the second way you're going to see nitrogen are these things called liquid doers on the left. 
It's a big cylinder uh, filled with liquid nitrogen that has a vapor on it, vaporizer on it as well that turns it into a gas. So maybe you start to use more nitrogen, you call the gas company, say, I need more nitrogen, they're going to switch you to a, a Dewar's instead of a bottle, which will last a little longer and you won't have to change it out quite as much. Still rather expensive and cumbersome and you have to have deliveries and you have, you know, if you run out and you have uh, evaporative losses and other things like that. And then the third way, which is a, more of a high volume user, are you see these large uh, bulk tanks. These are filled, again, with liquid nitrogen. A truck comes and fills up the tank and then they measure it off site to see how much nitrogen you're using and then charge you per cubic foot. So that is a pretty simple way for the gas company to make money. They make a large volume of liquid and drop it off to your facility in those three uh, packaged forms. So what we do is a little bit different. We generate your own nitrogen. So we have a compressor and a nitrogen generator. And the nitrogen generator basically separates the nitrogen molecule from the oxygen molecule. The nitrogen's a bit uh, larger, it's a little bit slower and lazier than the oxygen, and the oxygen's hyper and smaller, and we're able to separate the two very easily so that we can get up to 99.999% pure nitrogen. Uh, it reduces your cost considerably, and this is the biggest reason to buy a generator. It's based on cost because a nitrogen molecule is a nitrogen molecule. You can't get better nitrogen from one source as you can from another, so you might as well pay the least amount for it. So we reduce our cost and we take control of your own gas supply instead of depending on a delivery. It's reliable, it's on demand whenever you need it. The equipment's very easily maintained. There's not a lot to, uh, to moving parts and things to go wrong, so the downtime is eliminated. And you eliminate the safety ha hazard of high pressure cylinders and all flows and all purities and pressures can be achieved for any and all applications. So we don't see anything that's too big or too small. We, we really have for uh, tailor-made for any application. So this slide is what I, uh, I think is the most important thing to consider, um, and I talk with my customers all the time about this. Uh, the national average for bulk tank, which is the big tanks that I, that I uh, showed you last that are filled with liquid, the average cost in the U.S. is about a dollar per CCF. A CCF is um, a 100 cubic feet. Um, we are able to generate it for about 20 cents per cubic feet. Uh, per, I'm sorry, 100 cubic feet. So depending on how much nitrogen you're using, the savings can get incredible. I, um, I just worked on a project with a UV um, system the other day, actually, and they were, use, they were spending a half a million dollars on nitrogen, which kind of blew my mind uh, that they were using that much, but they did, and we sized up a generator that could uh, supply that amount, and the cost savings were so significant that they uh, felt compelled to, to investigate it further, and we'll, we'll hear about that later. But Bottom line is what we do with this, we find out what you're, how much nitrogen you're using, what purity is it, what pressure is it, and then we put together the system that will give you the gas that you need, and we do a, des a design criteria with an ROI, very simple. How much nitrogen are you using? How much does our equipment cost? Put in a lease payment to show the monthly payment, because that's what you'll pay in the, uh, in the gas company is a monthly payment. And then we figure out the, uh, the operating cost, so the maintenance and also the KW cost of the compressor that feeds the generator. So we're factoring in everything it costs you to generate your own nitrogen, which includes electricity, maintenance, and the capital cost of the generator. And then show an ROI of hopefully less than two, two years, three years. Um, different People have different criteria on what a good ROI is. But we save money every day. If, the, if somebody is buying from the gas company and they're tired of it, a nitrogen generator is absolutely ideal. Uh, and I would say, really, the only reason to buy a nitrogen generator is to save money. Uh, it, that anybody can make nitrogen, just like the gas company does every day. Um, but we can do it, too, at a much lower price. And uh, it's just a matter of answering a few simple questions. It's not a long, drawn-out process uh, to get to an idea of if it's worth uh, looking into for your specific uh, application. So I really appreciate everybody's time and the chance to you know, introduce you to nitrogen generator. It's kind of a unique product and kind of a niche product that not a lot of people know about. And uh, so thanks again. Okay, thanks, Brett. Very much appreciate that. Um, I think a lot of people overlook some of the costs like that in their, in their process. So, all right, now at this point, uh, Brandon is going to set us up for questions, and uh, we'd like to ask invite all of you to go ahead and uh, submit any questions that you might have. Uh, if you could please note 
uh, where they're, uh, which, which speaker you're directing them to. It'll make it a little easier for us. But uh, Brandon, why don't you take it from there? All right. Thanks. Thank you uh, to everybody, and I want to especially thank you, uh, Mike, for, for really putting this all together. So, folks, if you have any questions for any of the speakers on any of the topics, you can type them into the Q&A window on your screen now. Um, and if you could just put either Mike, Wilson, or Brett, you know, the, the, their names and sort of a reminder of what it was that they talked in the order they went is in the notes pod right above the Q&A window. So thank you, everybody. Mike Kelly, I think that first question might be for you. Um, the one from Francis? Oh, just convincing a customer oh, about Leon. the cost. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, well, it, yeah, it's, I'll respond back to Leon. Thanks for your question. Um, it says, how to convince my customer about cost. Can you comment a little bit? You have to do a full ROI on, um, on the application. So you need to take into consideration the, the coding comparison like I showed you. And then there's the cost of capital. A lot of people think that water-based systems and solvent-based systems, the equipment are less than UV. And in some cases, they're more expensive than, than UV. So you need to take into consideration that the maintenance, um, especially if you have water-based, you know, what's the floor space cost, you know, because you're going to have some type of air table or oven. With solvent, you may have an RTO for burning the solvent. So you need to factor in all that and, and, and keep it simple. Um, and then use your vendors. I mean, we're happy to support you in any, any application for UV. Um, use your vendors for that type of information. So there's a, second, there's a second question there that from Francis that says, hello, Mike. Do a significant percentage of your coating benefit from a nitrogen atmosphere in the cure? I would say yes. Um, it has to be practical, though. So um, we've used it in the past. It works extremely well. Um, but it's only used where you're having an issue. So, um, but it is readily uh, acceptable to normal UV coatings. I think that next question is for you, Brett. Okay. Can you connect a nitrogen generator to a pre-existing bulk nitrogen tank? Um, no, uh, you're you're basically replacing the nitrogen bulk tank. Um, you'll you would terminate your contract with the gas company, no and no longer pay the rental fee on that tank, and then replace it with a in-house nitrogen generator, which would include a compressed air source. Uh, filtration to make sure the air is clean, and then it goes into a nitrogen generator, and then we store nitrogen just in a in a tank, just like uh, it looks like uh, the bulk tank, but it's a, a receiver tank. So you are you're replacing your bulk um, with a nitrogen generator. Thank you. And Wilson, I think next one's for you. Okay, regarding plasma treatments, are there any ozone generated while in operation? Uh, what with plasma and blown arc, uh, if I just turn on the unit, there's not going to be any ozone admitted. You are going to introduce some NOx, which is less than 1% of the amount of air that you put in, but ozone is not generated. Now, there is a caveat to that. If there are oxygen species on the surface of the material, you can create ozone. A very good example of this is a polypropylene mesh. They use it for absorbent materials like diapers and things like that. Uh, for whatever reason, there is a, a high quantity of oxygen species on that surface. So if I do treat that surface, I will create ozone. But with most materials, you're not creating ozone. I think the next one's for you, too. How does atmospheric plasma compare to vacuum plasma? In general, you can do the same thing with both. In practice, it's a lot more difficult. Uh, and by that, I mean most of the atmospheric plasma treatments that I talked about today are line of sight type treatments. So if I'm treating something, I need to be able to see it. If I'm going to try to treat the inside of, say, a Coke bottle, or if I'm going to try to treat a foam or something, and I need to get all the way down into pores to make it oleophobic or hydrophobic, 
With those types of materials, I'm going to have to use a vacuum-type plasma. So basically line of sight. If I can see the area that I'm treating, I can do it very effectively with atmospheric plasma. If for some reason if it's around a corner or around an area that I can't see visually, then it's very difficult to treat with open air. You have to go with vacuum in that case. Uh, I think next question's for you, Brett. What would be the best way to efficiently apply nitrogen in a UV conveyor application? Um, as far as efficient, the best way to do it is to, to generate your own nitrogen, but to how to most efficiently apply it to a conveyor? Mike Bonner, would you would you have some maybe some input on that? I'm not sure I can adequately answer that. Um, that's got to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. It has to do with part geometry. It has to do with how you're actually applying it. So there's a lot of different things to consider there. Again, the best way to do that is to do your conveyor group and to get with your, your parts people figure all of that out yeah. and then uh, identify your source from there. Yeah, and this is Mike Kelly. Um, typically, you know, nitrogen's heavy, so it works for your advantage. Typically, you'll have some, some type of um, sink or some type of bath that you can put in that's at a lower level, typically, and that, that, that's the way I've seen it applied. Good point. Take another one for you, Wilson. All right. Uh, how does the compa compare the cost of adhesion promoters like uh, primers to plasma treatment? Uh, plasma treatment, the upfront cost is a little bit more uh, because you have to buy the equipment. The incremental cost is significantly less. So over the course of usually just a few months, uh, you can uh, you'll start saving money. Uh, to operate a single plasma jet costs about 10 to 15 cents per hour. Uh, there is no incremental cost because you're using compressed air and power, and that's usually what your power rate is. So uh, the other advantage it has over other adhesion promoters is many solvents and primers that you use uh, have, uh, you have to be careful on how you dispose of those things. So you reduce cost and disposal is there in that, in that case as well. So uh, there's there's advantages to both as far as price, again, upfront versus ROI, uh, but in the long term, plasma is much less expensive and a lot more repeatable. Okay, the next question is for me, Hadi. Uh, thank you very much for your question. It says, what about the shelf time and storage condition of UV coatings compared to solvent or water-based coatings? Typically, we, we, we're, we offer six months for the UV. Um, typically, they'll go a lot longer than six months, but the, just as a standard, it's it's six months. Um, storage conditions, you can store it. They, can, they, they don't typically freeze, so they, they're not damaged by freezing or um, when they're shipped on a truck or anything like, like, like water-based. Um, you know, I don't really know yep. the, the um, duration for solvent and water-based coating. Um, it's typically by manufacturer. We don't make many of those materials. Um, I can really just tell you what the, the UV and the advantages of UV over those. Thank you. Wilson, I think the next two questions are for you. All right. The first is similar to another question, how effective is blown arc plasma to vacuum plasma? They both are very similar. They both do the same thing. They can both clean the surface, they can both etch the surface, and they can both add the functional groups that are going to increase the surface energy. Generally, it's just a matter when you choose one over the other, it's the form of the product. Again, uh, if, I'm using, if I'm trying to treat a filter, then I'm going to use a vacuum plasma. If I'm trying to treat inside of a, a crevice or a container, I'm generally going to use a vacuum plasma. If I can treat the outside of it, then I will probably choose uh, a blown arc or a blown ion type plasma. So they both do very, very similar things. It's just generally on the form of the product. Uh, the second question, how wide a web can uh, plasma treat? Um, pretty much infinite. Uh, it's just a matter of economics at that point. Now, if we're doing we're talking about corona, we've made corona systems that will treat many meters wide. Uh, if you're talking about something that has to be treated with plasma, uh, then uh, it's just the amount of the cost per linear inch, and that's what we're doing by offering these larger plasma systems. Uh, before, uh, two years ago, to treat a linear inch with plasma might have been as high as forty or $50,000 per linear inch. Uh, now we're getting that price down below ten or $15,000 per linear inch. 
so it just, again, it, it, it's the economics of the situation. Uh, you can go as wide as you want. Another thing we can do is with Flame, and Flame is much more economical for wide applications. You can go very, very fast with Flame, uh, and we can put as many heads across there as we need. We usually limit it to about a 16-inch head because you don't have to water cool the heads below 16 inches, um, but we can pretty much treat any width. Okay, this is a question from Mike. Uh, in your experience, what percentage of coatings are 100% solids and what percent contain solvent for viscosity control? We typically see um, um, solvents not mainly used for viscosity control. We typically see them for um, the film thickness. So in like pipe and tube industry, it's 100% solid UV, typical automotive application, same thing. But in the uh, cosmetic industry or the closure industry, um, you're typically seeing solvent added to the UV. Um, and it's for basically for the, uh, the film thickness and, and the look. Um, you'll get a very, very um, uh, cosmetically appealing look when you use solvent-based UV for, on plastics, polypropylenes, ABS, and things like that. So typically, that's, um, that's where it's used at. Um, it's not necessarily used to control viscosity because the, there's a lot of resins uh, available today that really help you when you're doing 100% solid coating. I think that next question is for you, Wilson. Okay. Uh, how do the outcomes of plasma treatment compare to corona treatment? Well, corona is a form of plasma. Uh, the differences basically are on how, the, how it's uh, transmitted to the surface and how the blown ions are trans or the ions are transmitted to the surface. Plasma generally does a better job cleaning the surface and is a longer lasting. Both of them are time decaying treatments, but with plasma you're usually talking about hours to days to weeks before the effect goes away, where corona you're usually talking uh, minutes to hours before uh, the next treatment has to take place. So uh, they'll both increase the surface energy. Usually plasma does a better job cleaning and will last longer. Uh, the next question looks like it's for me as well. How far does the plasma treat station need to be from the spray booth? We can do a lot of different things here. We can, with the, just the general system that we have, we can have a lead of an 18 foot lead. So we'd have to be at least 18 feet from the area that you're treating uh, to the generator, uh, but we can take those things apart. We do have to be at least 18 feet from the transformer. So if you have an application where 18 feet is not far enough, we can use the control system and the transformer separately instead of in one convenient package, and uh, usually you can get out there to it. So it's, uh, we can put that transformer in a different box, and it can be as far away as we want it to be from the, the frequency generator. So uh, 18 feet from the transformer is about as far as we go. It looks like the next one was for me. Um, can you use a single nitrogen generator for supplying nitrogen for different labs, or do we need one generator for a room? No, you can run as many airlines as you need to, uh, as long as we have enough flow for the uh, applications. It's no problem. Do that all the time. And working with more universities lately in that same situation where there's multiple buildings and different people using nitrogen for different applications, and we're able to, uh, to split the airlines and supply nitrogen to multiple locations. So thank you for the question. All right, the next question is for me. Uh, do you need plasma pretreatment for UV coatings? Can corona suffice? Uh, you don't necessarily need it. It depends on the material that you're treating and it depends on the surface energy of that material. Uh, in many cases, corona will suffice. So uh, it just depends, again, on the, the form of the product that you're treating and trying to coat uh, and which one makes the most sense. Uh, but again, generally, we treat, if it's a plastic, uh, pretreatment usually is necessary to get the surface energy high enough to get a good bond. Okay, we've got a great question from Sangeetha. Hi, can we use your UV coatings for 3D printing as well? Um, we produce 3D printing resins um, that's not really on our website. We produce for a lot of people that are brand labeled. So I would, I would say they're similar, but they're not something you can just use for 3D printing. So if you have more questions, just get a hold of me directly and I can help. Okay, 
Do we have any more questions? I think we've reached the end of the list at this point. If nobody's got any more questions, then I'm going to take this opportunity to thank you all for being here and uh, invite you to reach out to each of the speakers to get more information. And I want to thank uh, Mike, Wilson, Brett, all three of you for uh, the time and the effort that you put into these uh, very informative presentations. So thank you all, and hope you'll join us for our next installment uh, sometime next year. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody.